Okay, AP Human Geo. One other thing I wanted to say is um, you should potentially, you could pause and copy down the notes and then listen to my uh, commentary after you've gotten the notes down. And then you can just add this as elaboration or you could just let it play through and then you could add the elaboration as you're writing the notes down. Whatever you, whatever the class consensus is, as to what will be best. And I honestly believe this right here. Okay, AP Human Geo, we're gonna try this out. Hopefully it is working well and you guys can hear me. I believe we left off on this slide for most of my classes. So we will start right here. Okay, so more on the green revolution. I'm gonna let you guys start copying this down, but um, first bullet point, gene manipulation creating environmental hazards. Potential for pollen dispersal from GMO plants creating super pests. What they're talking about with this, with this idea of super pests is that we are afraid that as pollen is dispersed from these GMOs to non-GMO plants, that they're going to create this new unintended hybrid, right? It sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, but in reality, this, is, this could be some kind of unintended consequence. What happens is when you think about it, we create these GMOs so that they are stronger, that they're more hardy, that they can grow in different kinds of, um, in different kinds of environments than they are originally designed to be. With these super pests, what they can do is potentially alter the DNA or create some kind of new hybrid for potential weeds or some other plant that we weren't intending to have these new altered um, characteristics. So that is a definite environmental hazard because all of a sudden maybe we have this new weed that completely kills and devastates corn plants or soybeans or some major crop that the United States de depends on this could be a huge problem. Another problem would be less genetic diversity. If you think about it on a large scale, or for humans as an example, is we're all genetically diverse in some ways. Not all of us get sick with the same colds. Not all of us, um, as a personal example, can go out in the sun and be okay, right? I would like turn into a tomato. So we all have our own little unique genetic um, differences, which is good because if ever some horrible virus were to say come along, not everyone would get sick with it, right? There's a certain percentage of the population, they say like 1% of the population is actually immune to HIV, right, as an example. Well, let's put this on, a, on the example of the, um, as far as crops go, that what if there's some kind of horrible disease that is spreading through certain crops, or what if there is a new, um, I don't know, Asian beetle or some kind of bug that goes after a specific type of crop. If there's not as much genetic diversity, this could be devastating, right? Because one type of disease, one type of pest could completely destroy an entire, could destroy an entire crop. So as if there's less genetic diversity, with everyone having, the, everyone having the same traits, if we genetically modify things, then one, one thing could wipe an, wipe an entire crop out versus non-genetically modified organisms, organisms have an inherent genetic diversity within them. There's also the concern over fertilizers and, chem, fertilizers and chemicals, um, a very valid concern, because with these... Um, we have fertilizers running on and, and chemicals that we use, like pesticides, getting into the groundwater, right? And then that eventually moves to the larger streams and back into our own drinking water. And it also has an effect. These fertilizers, what's happening is what's really interesting is that when you see the groundwater returning to... So the fertilizers are sprayed on the crops. It goes into the groundwater. It flows into, like, let's say a larger river or... And eventually... It will flow, the river, like say it flows into the Mississippi River and eventually it'll flow into the Gulf of Mexico. What happens is we see these algae blooms because the fertilizers still act as fertilizers. 
So these huge algae is a, is a natural plant that grows in water. These algae blooms are gigantic. It's an unintended consequence. We don't, we didn't mean, we we're wanting to fertilize our corn and our soybeans. We didn't want to fertilize the algae, but the algae is so huge, it's actually suffocating the fish because it takes the oxygen out of the water. These are these unintended consequences that we didn't know were going to happen on, with these environmental hazards when we manipulate these plants on a genetic level. The impact on small farmers and export agriculture. The Green Revolution has done little to address and alleviate poverty. Because think about it, who is behind a lot of these genetic modifications? Large companies. And in order for these large companies to turn a profit, they have to be somewhat expensive. All right? So if you think about it in that sense, they are not meant to be. We see these like large farms, and we're going to get into this when we learn about agribusiness. But we see these large farms buying thousands of dollars worth of worth of agricultural products in order to um, in order to turn a profit. You won't see this on small farms, and especially you won't see this in less developed countries. I think I've talked long enough so that you guys should be able to get all of this down. If not, we can pause this a little bit longer. Actually, I kind of like that idea. Why don't you pause as soon as I get to a new new slide? You guys can copy it down, and then what you can do is listen to me talk and add it in. Uh, with the onset of the Green Revolution, we've seen the rise of different farming concepts. So agribusiness, like I referenced in the last slide, a system of economic and political relationships that organize food production. We're going to go more into this later. But basically, it's the... It's like the, the factory system almost being applied to agriculture. It's kind of, fact, we call it factory farming on a large scale. Also, biotechnology. Chemical farming, inorganic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and genetically modified crop, crops. It, biotechnology is the cornerstone of the green revolution. Pause it if you need to continue to write this down. Otherwise, I think we are... Good to continue on. All right. More about genetically modified organisms. Crops that carry new traits that have been inserted through advanced genetic engineering methods. One type are hybrid crops. Plant breeders crossbreed compatible types of plants in an effort to create a plant with the best features of both parents. All right. So peppermint, a hybrid between spearmint and watermint, right? Or they take, they basically just take two different types and combine them together. We've done this with wheat, grapefruit, and tomatoes as well to get certain traits that we like the, the most. An example that you guys may be more familiar with, although I feel like all of us should know what peppermint is, is the crossbreeding of animals. It refers to the process of breeding often with the intention to create offspring that share the traits of both parent lineages or produce an animal with hybrid vigor. All right, so for an example would be a labradoodle, a cross between a poodle and a retriever. There's another, um, another example for a dog. They're puggles, and it's a pug and a beagle together. That would be my personal choice. If I had to have a hybrid animal, I would choose a puggle, personally. But, um, yeah, so you don't really see other, um, or you do see crossbreeding of animals, but not very common, but it does happen. I think you guys should pause this, or I'm going to continue to move on. These are very important things that that I'm saying, so I think we should try to write these down. Um, we should be getting this, getting this information off of the slides first, and then writing what I'm saying down to elaborate. All right. So on this slide, what we're going to do is we look at genetically modified food (GMOs) in the United States. So GMOs make up 75% of all processed foods in the United States. So that means any processed foods. Think about what processed foods are. These would be things that we that are already pre-made that we buy in grocery stores. So these would be any kind of like frozen dinners. These would be 
um, anything that a lot of we actually eat a lot of processed foods anything that's been like dehydrated and that you just have to like easily microwave or add water to um, would be a good example so if you guys eat like I don't know any kind of microwave dinner would be an example 38 percent of all acres of corn in the US are genetically modified 80% of all acres of soybeans are from genetically engineered seeds. And in 2010, the share of GMOs of maize, soybeans, and cotton increased by approximately 90%. That's huge. So if we look at this, right here we see soybeans, 93% up here. Rapid growth and adoption of genetically engineered crops in the United States. So as we see from 1996 to 2010, it is definitely increasing in popularity. Why do we think that this, this increase is happening? It would be most likely because yield is higher. So why would farmers want to think about this? Why would farmers pass up? Maybe they pay a little bit extra to get these genetic, genetically modified seeds, but their yields are much higher, and they don't have to worry about losing the crop as much because these are usually hardier plants, especially if they're Roundup ready. All right, genetically modified organisms. Some regions have embraced, but some have banned. There is a broad, there's broad scientific consensus that food on the market derived from gen genetically modified crops pose no greater risk than conventional food. Yet many still, yet many still will not deal with genetically modified products. All right, so if you look at the green in this, in in here these are areas that have no genetically modified um, crops or there's an actual ban on them yellow has restricted genetically modified food and red what we are doesn't have that kind of ban clearly because we have so much because so much of our prepared food and so much of our food guys if you've eaten in our cafeteria you've had genetically modified food you we don't even realize when we eat it much of Europe is against its use, but citizens of Europe seem to be moving towards more acceptance. So Europe is, a, is kind of the hotbed of where they do not want to use genetically modified food. But, I mean, the United States came up with it, so obviously we're a big fan of it. Um, but yeah, there are some risks to it, but we can't really prove that, right? So some people believe that it causes some problems, but kind of your conclusion to make. All right. Some poor regions refuse genetically modified organisms as foreign invasions of crops. They concern that it is another attempt at European or U.S. colonialism against their independent nation. So what they'll say is that what you're trying to do is oh, that these American seeds or these European seeds are going to replace everything that we have from all of our crops that we we reharvest and plant every year and then this is what's really interesting guys is that genetically uh, many genetically modified crops are actually um, incapable of being planted in the next year so they call themselves ter they're referred to as terminator crops because what happens is the plants do not produce if they do produce seeds they're sterile so that they will not be able to be grown or they just don't produce seeds that can be harvested to be grown the next year. Think about why an agribusiness would do this. It forces them to buy genetically modified seeds that next year. It's a great business plan. But that's a huge problem for poor countries, right? In in uh, in poorer regions because they're gonna they won't be able to afford to purchase those um, seeds every year because what they they would just harvest their own seeds and replant those the next year. This is a picture of glowfish, one of the first genetically modified animals to become publicly available as a pet. I believe I don't know if I've ever actually seen these in person, but I don't know what animal they took the 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 bioluminescence from, but they inserted that into these fish and they do glow.
All right, we are going to stop there. That last slide, I want to be in class to go over it with you. So we are going to do that. Otherwise, right now, you should, at once this is over, you should go onto Schoology and download the, the uh, Dairying Free Response Practice. You're going to write this on a separate piece of paper on your own, and you're going to turn that in at the end of the period to the substitute. And I hope you guys are all on your best behavior. And have a good weekend.